Okay, brothers and sisters in Christ, I want to come out here again. I want to do an overwhelm study on will the church suffer through the through the tribulation? And the answer to that question is no. Now, today tonight we got into a big fight with someone because we found out this guy was a post tribber. He came into the room and he started saying all these ridiculous things. It's totally ridiculous. So I said something and these people, they say the same things over again. And yet, I told him, you better read your Bible. He's like, I do read my Bible. Blah, 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 blah. Well, I guess he, ha he doesn't know how to read plain English. So afterwards, so, I, so many people are taking scriptures out of context. And believe me, you don't want to be messing around with God's holy word. His inerrant word. That's totally inspired by God. Because there's no mistake in the truth. The only mistake is you. So I told this guy... Because the stuff that he was saying, I'm like, if you want to believe a lie, that's fine. Go ahead, believe a lie. And I said some other stuff to him. If he's probably not even saved, but if he is saved, he'll be taken up in the rapture. If he's not, he will be left behind. Now, I want to get into what somebody said to me. Cause, because I called him a fool, okay? I said, I have to, I'm leaving, because I was leaving the, the conversation. I said, I'm leaving. Uh, my Bible tells me not to uh, to fight with any fool. Because all that these people want is to fight, 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 and argue and argue and argue. And yet after that, you know what somebody said to that? He said, oh, the Bible says whoever calls his brother a fool is in danger of hellfire. Huh. Like, I never knew that. I just learned something new. Not. I already knew that chapter. But yeah, what's the Bible say? Let's read the whole context, please, instead of taking one thing and trying to throw it in with that. Now, I'm going to show you right here. This is what this person was trying to tell me, right here. Let's read it. It's in Matthew chapter 5, okay? Matthew chapter 5, verse 22, because after somebody commented, Hey, the Bible says whoever calls his brother a fool is in danger of hellfire. Let's see what the Bible really says. Let's read the whole context, because remember, when you have a pre... When you have a you have to read the pretext. What's the pretext say? The verse before that. That's what people have to learn is to let the scripture speak for itself. That is found in Matthew chapter 5, verse what? Verse 22. Look at this. Right here. But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause. You see that? Without a cause. That means for no reason. I had a reason to be angry because this guy's messing around with God's word. Without a cause, shall be in danger of the, shall be in danger of the what? Judgment. And whoever says to his brother, re, re, wait, re, shall be in danger of the council. But whoever says you fool shall be in danger of hellfire. Yeah, exactly. You'll be in danger of hellfire. But read the pretext before that. It says clearly, without a cause. Remember to always line it up. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm not the first one. Yesterday I had another brother in there that was getting attacked. We're all getting attacked. Why is it attacked so much? Because it's the truth, man. This is the truth. I'm going to show you straight from Scripture right now. Now, She's trying to take this verse here because I call this person a fool. Now, let us go to the book of Proverbs. Let's see what the book of Proverbs says. They're totally different. Totally different things that we're talking about here, people. This is what people need to understand. But I guess they, they don't because they just want to go with their head tells them, which they should go by what the Word of God tells you. Go to Proverbs chapter 26. Okay? Verse 4 and on. What does it say? Do not answer a fool according to his fully, lest you also be like him. Huh. Lest you also be like him. You're, you're both going to look like fools because you're both sitting there arguing. Well, let's continue reading. Answer a fool according to his fully, lest he be wise in his own eyes. Exactly. Most of these post-tribbers and mid-tribbers, they're all wise in their own eyes. He who sends a message by the hand of a fool cuts off his own feet and drinks violence. 
like the, like the legs of the lame that hang lean. Is a proverb in the mouth of fools like one who builds a stone in the sling? Is he who gives honor to a fool? Huh. Lots of those around. Like a throne that goes into the hand of a drunken. You guys can read the rest in verse 14. So anyways, this is what I want to get into right now. Oh yeah, and this guy's like, oh, the rapture came into being in 1800s by a man by the name of John F. Darby. Huh, really? You know what? I've been reading my Bible over and over again, and you know what the first time I heard that from? I heard that from Jack Van Impey. I was like, what? Are you serious? It came by John F. Darby back in 1830, and yet I've been hearing it all from the Word of God, and yet this Bible is over 2,000-something years old. That is a lie from the pit of hell. I'm going to be putting a video description below my inbox by Thomas Ike. May you guys listen to him. He explains it all about the rapture. It comes from the Greek word harpazo. Oh, you can't find the word rapture in the Bible. Let me tell you something, my friend. You can't find the word trinity in the Bible. You can't find the word Bible in the Bible. You can't find the word missions in the Bible. The word rapture is found in the Latin Vulgate. Because remember, it was originally written in Greek. It's raptus to be quickly removed, harpazo, which means to be caught up by a powerful force, the snatching away. But I guess these people haven't done any research. They're just listening to their false teachers that they want to, like I said, they want to accept what is appealing to them. They don't want to go by the authority of Holy Scripture, and yet this Bible bears testimony to the truth. Now let us go to the Word of God. Let us go to the book of Genesis, all right? Let us go to the book of Genesis, and let's see what God pours his wrath upon. Well, the tribulation is not God's wrath. Huh. Yeah, it is. And many people are going to find out very shortly that it is. And it's not going to be funny. These people are distorting the gospel. So let's read what Abraham was saying to God. You guys want to get a Bible? Get your Bible up. Get your Bible out. And you guys can follow along with me. And you guys can see for yourself here. Genesis chapter 18, verse, verse 23. And Abraham came near and said, Would you, now he's asking God, Would you also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Now would he? Would God actually do such a thing? Let's find out. Suppose there were 50 righteous within the city would you also destroy the place and not spare and not spare it for the 50 righteous that were in it far be it from you to do such a thing as this huh to do such a thing as this to slay the righteous with the wicked so that the righteous should be as the wicked so we're going to be just like the wicked far be it from you shall not the judge of all the earth do right. So the Lord said, If I find in Sodom fifty righteous within the city, then I will spare all the place for their sake. So we see it there as well, that God will not. He already had a plan out. Because if you go to look at chapter 19, this is what the angels are saying to, uh, to Lod and his family. Go to verse 22. Hurry, escape there, for I cannot do anything. He can't do anything. You see that? Hurry, escape there, for I cannot do anything until you arrive there. Therefore, the name of the city was called Zoro. The sun, look at this. The sun had risen upon the earth when Lot entered Zoro. Then, look at that. Then the Lord rained brimstone and fire on Sodom and Gomorrah, from the Lord out of the heavens. So clear. So clear as day, man. They were removed. Okay. That was Genesis chapter 18, verse 23, and Genesis chapter 19, verse 22, and on. Now, we're going to, I don't know if it's in Deuteronomy or Numbers, it's in 16. Let me see if it's here. 16. 
verse 19. Yeah, right here. Go to this right now. Okay, guys, go to this. <coughs> Numbers chapter 16, verse 20. Numbers 16, verse 20. What does it say? And the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, Separate yourself from among this congregation, that I may consume them in a moment. Then they fell on their faces and said, O oh God, the God of the spirits of all flesh, shall one man sin, and you be angry with all the congregation? So the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the congregation, saying, Get away from the tents of Karen and Gila and Abram. It's Abram? Then Moses rose and went to Dish and Abram. I don't know these words. And the elders of Israel followed him. And he spoke to the congregation, saying, Depart from, look at that, depart now from the tents of these wicked men. Touch nothing of theirs lest you be consumed in all their sins. So, they got away from around the tents of, and explains the name of the tents, came out and stood on the door of their tents with their wives, their sons, and their little children. And Moses said, By this you shall know that the Lord has sent me to do all these works, for I have not done them of my own will. If these men die naturally like all men, or if they are visited by the common fate of all men, then the Lord has not sent me. But if the Lord creates a new thing, and the earth opens its mouth and swallows them up with all the belongings to them, and they go down alive into the pit, then you will understand that those men have rejected the Lord. Now it came to pass, as he finished speaking all these words, that the ground split apart under them, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up with their household and all the men with, with, with all their goods. So they, so they and all those with them went down alive into the pit. The earth closed over them, and they perished from among the assembly. Then all Israel who were around them fled at their cry, for they said, Lest the earth swallow us up also. And fire, look at that, and fire came out from the Lord and consumed the 250 men who were offering incense. So, right here as well. You see, Moses was asking God a question. Because of one man's sin, shall everybody suffer now? So God told them, tell them to separate from this congregation. And God destroyed them. We see it all through the Bible, my friend. Now, even Enoch, that's a, that's a perfect example. Enoch is a picture of the rapture of the church. Look at Genesis chapter 5, verse 24. And Enoch walked with God and was not, for God took him. Who's gone? God took him. Even Elijah. Elijah was taken. So look, Enoch was taken before the worldwide flood. Elijah was taken before God judged the nation of Israel. Like we see this all through the Bible, my friend. Now, let us go to the book of Matthew. This is totally ridiculous. Like what these post trippers do here. Because I heard it. I heard the videos, ladies and gentlemen. I'm not afraid to listen to them. Okay? Because I know that they're in error, okay? Because the Bible is very clear. Oh, Matthew chapter 13, Jesus talking to the church here, and if you notice, he does not say, let them be taken, let them grow together. So you see, the church is going to endure the tribulation. No, it's not. Let's read it all in context. Because prophecy is being preached wrong today. Many people are preaching things that are referring to the second coming, that are not referring to the, uh, the rapture. Oh, the second coming and the rapture are the same event. No, they're not. They're, they're not the same event, people. You have to go by... What's it called? Sequent events. There's certain events that have to happen before other events can occur. Let's see who Jesus was uh, talking to here, okay? I would rather listen to Jesus than man because my Bible tells me clearly 
may God be true and every man a liar, Romans 3, 4. And God is not a man that he should lie. So let's see. And by the way, Jesus was God incarnated in the human flesh. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Huh. So let's find out what Jesus said here in Matthew chapter 13. Let us start from verse 9. Look at this. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Why isn't the church mentioned? It just says, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Because the church was not born yet, maybe. Not maybe. That is the case. The church was not born yet. But I guess these people, they don't have that much uh, intelligence up there. And yet, they're teaching people other stuff, which is a false gospel. And my Bible clearly tells me that preaches to you another gospel other than what you've heard. Let them be accursed. Huh. These people are actually cursed, like it or not. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And the disciples came and said to him, Why? See, they're asking Jesus, Why do you speak to them in parables? Oh, I wonder why. Why in the world is Jesus speaking to them in parables? I wonder why. Let's, let, let's find out in the, in the following verse. In verse 11. He answered and said to them, Because it has been given to you. Ah, oh, it's been given to the Jews. It has been given to you to know the mysteries. Look at that. The mysteries of the... Oh, the mystery. The mystery is the church. Remember. Behold, I tell you a mystery. No, this is not talking about that, my friend. It says it clearly. Read the whole thing in context. Because it has been given to you to know the what? The mysteries of what? The church? No. The mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. But to them, look at this, but to them it has not been given. Huh. It has not been given. You see? It has not been given to them. It was originally for the Jew. So it says clear, it has been given to, it has not been given. It has not been given. Exactly. Now, let's go up here where it's talking about the parable that Jesus gave here, okay? This is crazy, ladies and gentlemen. Literally insane what people do to God's Word. But I want to read it to you. Because this is what I heard a post-tribber saying. Look, right here it says, this is Matthew chapter 13, verse 25 now. Matthew 13, verse 25. But while man... Okay, but while man slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the grain had sported, was that sported and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. Look at this. So the servant, so the servant of the owner came and said to, said to him, this is what this post tripper said. See, they're asking, do you want us to be taken out? She's trying to refer this to the rapture, which is totally, she's totally mentally, she's mental. She, she's crazy. Put it that way. She's, she's crazy, man. So the servant of the owner came and said to, said to what? To him, sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it ha have terrors? He said to them, an enemy has done this. The servant said to him, do you want us then to go and gather them up. Huh. I want to gather them up. That must be talking about the rapture. No, it's not. Like these post trippers try to make it be. It's crazy the, the stuff that these, these people do, man. They're totally off doctrine. Gather them up. But he said, no. Look at this. No. Lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let both, oh, look at this, let both grow together until the harvest. You see, we're not going to be here. I mean, they would say, you see, we're going to be here. We're going to be, we're going to grow together, which clearly shows there's no rapture. No, nope, you're totally off doctrine, my friend. This is clearly talking about the second coming, which we're going to see in a minute. Now, let's, let's read from verse 30 now. Read from verse 30, okay? Let both grow together until the harvest, and at the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, first, look at this, first, remember the first, and remember what 1 Thessalonians says, for the dead in Christ shall rise first, correct? 
Go and read it. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 and on. Let me quote the text as it is. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then for we who are alive and remain shall be caught up. That's where the word rapture comes from. We shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And from that time on shall we ever be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Yeah, right. You want me to comfort you? With, you want me to? How can we comfort each other if we're going to go through seven years of hell on planet Earth, my friend? you got to be, I think you're a little mentally challenged. You need to go get your meds taken or something. Seriously. It wouldn't make sense if Paul were to say that. So let's read it and find out what it's talking about here. Remember, it says clear. The one that is taken first. Right here. Let's find out what happens to the one that is taken first. But he said, no, lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot them. Uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And look at this. And at the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, first, look at this, first, gather together the terrors. Huh. Looks like they're, they're talking to the wicked people here, man. Gather the terrors and bind them in, in what? Binions? To burn them? Ah, to burn them. This is totally opposite of the rapture, my friends. To burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. The wheat is talking about believers, those people that survived the tribulation. What's going to happen to them? Into my barn. And another parable he put forth, and it goes on and on. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, and it goes on and on. But they did not understand this uh, parable, so Jesus explains it here, right here. Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house and his disciples came to him saying explain to us the parable of the terrors of the field he answered and said to them he who sows the good seed is the son of man the field is the word yeah the, the field is the world the good seeds are the sons of the kingdom but the terrors are the sons of the wicked one the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest, look at this, the harvest is the end of the age. The reapers are the angels. Therefore, look at this, therefore as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of this age. The Son of Man will send out his angels and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend in those who practice lawlessness and will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Huh, into the kingdom. I wonder what kingdom that is. That's another false teaching going around as well. There is no such thing as a 1,000 year reign. But yet Jesus says clear that they're going to shine in the glory of their kingdom. Or oh, it's all spiritual. No, it's not. This is a literal kingdom, my friend. Okay? This is a literal kingdom. And look at here. Matthew 16 where it talks about when Jesus comes. Where he says he's going to judge. Yeah, right here. Matthew chapter 16 verse 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For, okay, where is it? Yeah, right here. For the Son of Man, for the Son of Man will come. Look at this. For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his father with his angels and then he will reward each according to his work according to his work second coming when he divides the nation we gathers all nations before him we're going there right now we're going there right now my friend so remember since the end of the age and yet what did the Jews ask Jesus here in Matthew chapter 24 verse 3 
Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us when will these things be and what will be the sign of sign of your coming and of the end of the age. The end of the age. And he gives a big list. Rumors of wars, false Christ, false prophets. He goes on and on. But look what he says here. And i got to warn you guys about this guy too. Alex Jones and uh, Stephen Anderson. They made a stupid video that's mocking the rapture. It's called After the Tribulation. These people are totally ridiculous. They're saying, ah, oh, the tribulation is not God's wrath. I wonder where they're getting that from. You see? They don't want to believe that God's going to pour out his wrath. It's a heretical teaching saying that Jesus is going to come back at the end of the tribulation, which Scripture clearly denies it. Scripture clearly denies it, and we're going to find out right now. Jesus is coming back, yes, at the second, at the second coming. That is not the rapture. So let's read it. So beware of that video. It's called After the Tribulation by Alex Jones and Stephen Anderson. They're making fun of the pre-tribulation rapture. Well, these people are in for a big shock if they're still alive when the rapture happens. Because I'm telling you, right now we are on the threshold of the tribulation, which means the rapture of the church is very, very close. It's about to happen. Many people are in for a great awakening when the rapture happens. They're suddenly going to discover what the Bible said was true. Millions of people, gone in an instant, vanished off of the face of the earth. And yeah, this is exactly what's going to happen. So let's see, let's read it here. Because many of these post-tribbers, this is their favorite Bible verse that they try to use to convince, to try to brainwash people that don't have any knowledge of Scripture. This is what they use here. Look at this. Immediately after, you see it says after the tribulation. It doesn't say before. Well, what is this referring to? It's talking about the second coming. Okay? Immediately after the tribulation of those days, because what were, they, what were they asking Jesus? What shall be the sign of thy coming? What will be the signs leading up to your second coming? And Jesus clearly gives. These are the signs. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven. Then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. You see that? All the tribes of the earth will mourn. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Now, I want to stop there. I'm going to take you to Revelation fast. You see? It says, All the tribes of the earth shall mourn as they see him. This is the exact same event. Let's go to Revelation. Talking about his second coming. Look. Revelation chapter 1 verse 7. What does it say? Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him, even they who pierced him. And look, all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. Same thing. The rapture is a sudden event. It could occur suddenly. It's going to occur suddenly and without warning. But yet the second coming still has signs. We still have seven years of signs. But yet the rapture precedes the second coming. The rapture is before. Because there are no signs to the rapture. The Bible does not tell us the specific date when the rapture will happen. But it does describe in great detail the events that will follow the rapture. That of the Great Tribulation and things that will precede that. Like about Israel and the nations and the church. And also that of the revived Roman Empire. And within the last 50 years, we saw tremendous changes which everything seems that the stage is all set for the rapture and the events that will follow the rapture, which means the rapture is very, very soon. Now let's continue reading where we left off at. Right here. Where it said, you'll see the Son of Man coming on, yeah, on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And now look, remember, and he will sin, look at that, and he will send his angels with a great sound. You notice that? With a great sound of what? Of a trump. And they will gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. So they are gathered. 
says it right there. There's a big difference there because it's the angels that are doing it. And yet, what's the Bible say? For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. It doesn't say the trump of God. It just says the trump. With the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. There's no mention of the dead here, man. There's no mention here, my friend, of the dead being raised. For the dead in Christ shall rise first, and for we who are alive. He says it's Jesus taking us himself. He's not sending angels. And he said the exact same thing in Matt, in uh, John chapter 14, where he said, Do not let your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. You see that? I will come again and receive you unto myself. He didn't say that he was going to send angels. So it says clear. They are gathered. Where are they gathered? It explains after in the next chapter, chapter 25. But look at this part right here. Verse 40. Then two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. Remember what he said previously. Remember what he said would happen? They'd be gathered and thrown into the fire. So one that is taken is taken in judgment. This is revert this is reverse the rapture. The one that is taken is taken in judgment. And the one that is left is left to enter into the millennium. How do I know that? Well, Matthew chapter twenty four, verse twenty eight, it says clear that for wherever the carcass is, there the eagles will be gathered. Now why is why is there a body and why are there why is there birds eating the body? It's like vultures coming to a dead carcass. Well, in Luke, if you go to the book of Luke, it explains it clear. Because the one that is taken is put to death. Look at this. Luke chapter seventeen, start from verse uh, thirty six. Two men will be in the field, one will be taken and the other left. Look at this, and they're answering, the, where, where are they taken, Lord? Like, you know, they want to know, where will they be taken? And they answered and said to him, where, Lord? So he said to them, wherever the body is, see, wherever the body is taken, wherever the body is, there the eagles will be gathered together. So it's clear that they're, they were literally put to death, and then they were thrown into hell. Because look at this right here. This clearly proves that there was no rapture that took place here. Because look, Matthew chapter 25, verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him. Huh. They're going to be gathered before him. And he will separate them. Uh, ex excuse me? Explain to me why does he have to separate them? Because if a rapture did occur that would have accomplished the separating. They would have been taken up with Jesus, which this clearly shows that there was no rapture whatsoever. It was just the gathering. He gathered the elect and the wicked. Like it says before in Matthew 13, let the wheat and the tares grow together until the end of harvest. Remember? So it says clear. All nations will be gathered before him. And he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides. See, they're all mixed up. They don't know who is who, so they're dividing them. It says, divide, divide his sheep from the goats. So the sheep are the saved and the goats are the lost. And he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. It's very clear that there was no rapture that occurred here. And what does he say in verse 34 to the righteous? To those people that survived the tribulation and have come to know Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, let's read it. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Just like what we saw before in Matthew 13. Now go to verse 41 and see what happens here. Then he will also say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you curse into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. So, now we've got a problem here on our hands, ladies and gentlemen. If the rapture did occur at the very end, like these people so bluntly try to teach it, but scripture clearly tells us that it's so false, but yet it's so popular, because people don't know their Bibles. People are so blind, 
why don't they just let scripture speak for itself? Let's just suppose if the rapture did occur, okay? That means you yep up and down, you come right back up, you come right back down, so you go up, you do a U turn, you come back down. Now, if that happened, there would be no reason for separation, okay? Because that would have accomplished it. The rapture would have accomplished the separating. There'd be no reason for him to separate the sheep from the goats, which this clearly shows that they're still in natural bodies. But I'm just saying, if it did happen, think about it. What happens at the rapture? You get an incorruptible body. You get a body like Jesus' body that can never die, no sin, no nothing. You got an you got a incorruptible body. You got a resurrected body. There's a problem here. You cannot have a millennium. If post-tribulation rapture was true, you cannot have a millennium. Why? Because you got a resurrected body, which means you cannot have sex. You cannot have sex in a resurrected body, my friend. Therefore, there's nobody left to populate the millennial kingdom. Now we got a big mess on our hands because the Bible clearly teaches that you can read it in Zechariah. It says Jesus will be king over all the earth. The people that refuse to come worship him, he'll send plagues on their country. They will not reign. You can find that in uh, Zechariah chapter 14, verse 16. Read it. But yet it says clearly, and this here too would make no sense whatsoever as well. Why in the world do you have Satan bound for a thousand years? Literal thousand years. You see that? Oh, that was just Jesus on the cross. No. So there's, there's false teaching saying there's no millennium, blah, blah, blah. But scripture is very clear. These people are going to give an account one day before God. They're in big trouble with God. Because the Bible clearly teaches. The authority of God's word clearly states that there is coming a 1,000 year reign millennial kingdom. Why do you think they're trying their very best right now to destroy Jerusalem and Israel? Because Satan knows prophecy. He knows if he can wipe out the Jew, then Jesus Christ cannot fulfill his word, which says he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and ever. Remember the angel Gabriel, where he said to Mary, Your son shall be great, and he shall rule over the house of Jacob forever and ever. And Jacob's name was changed to Israel. Second Kings chapter 17, verse 34. And all through the book of, uh, look at this here, Revelation chapter 12, verse 5. She bore a male child who was to rule all, look at that, all nations. How are you going to rule all nations if there is no one? Huh, it's crazy. But there would be no reason for uh, Satan to be bound, because what's the very purpose for him being bound? Let's read it. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand, he let hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more. Huh? How can he deceive nations if Jesus is finished judging the nations? And he just finished casting the wicked into hell, and he only has the righteous with him. Doesn't make sense here, man. Because where Jesus goes, we go. Hmm. Wow. Shouldn't deceive the nations no more. Till the thousand years. You see, till means he's going to do it after. Till the thousand years, we're finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. Then it goes on, you see? Now the resurrection occurs. You see that? Resurrection happens like a day after. Verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls. Look at that. I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their forehead or on their Hand. And they look at this, and they lived and what? And reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Huh. They reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The Bible clearly teaches a thousand years. You can find it all through the Old Testament, New Testament, you name it. But look what it says. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years <coughs> were finished. This is the first resurrection, which clearly shows that the thousand year is literal all through the Bible. 
God says something, he means it. The Bible says it, and it's going to happen precisely and in detail. So it goes on, what it says about Satan. Now, when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison, and will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, whose number is as the sand of the sea. Huh. The sand of the sea. Wow, that's a lot of people, man. Where in the world did you get all those people? It's because the people that survived the tribulation, they were still in natural bodies, which clearly showed there was no rapture that happened. It was the second coming. It was just the gathering to the nation, to judge the nation, to see who took the mark of the beast, those that were saved and those were not saved. Those that survived the tribulation have come to Christ. They were welcomed into the, the millennial reign. And those that rejected them and worshipped the beast, they're cast into hell. So the people that survived the tribulation, their offspring, their children will grow up. And then their children, their children, their children. And even at the end of the thousand years, there's, there's going to be a great rebellion. People will still say no to Jesus Christ. So, it says it very clear that there is no rapture there. So the post-trib is a lie, even the mid-tribbers. Think about it. By people throwing this in there, okay, that means they know the exact day and hour to the, if the mid-trib was right. Because think about it. Go to Daniel. At the signing of the seven-year peace treaty, they will know the exact day and hour. If Jesus comes one year, two years, three years, six months left, boom. We're out of here. They know. And by them throwing the church into the tribulation, they're totally messing up God's program that he has planned out for Israel. There's two programs that God, God has for the tribulation. It's the time of Jacob's trouble, and it's the time of God pouring his wrath upon Israel and the Gentile nations to deal with the rebellion of sin. But yet, God took care of all that at the cross. Jesus Christ was judged at the cross. Sin was judged. So the very purpose for the tribulation is the outpouring of God's wrath. And yet, the Bible says clearly that Jesus took our punishment. So we cannot, so the, put it this way. The hammer fell on Jesus so it does not have to fall on us. And we're not appointed unto wrath. We are not the object of God's wrath, my friend. Get that, get that, okay? It's clearly in scripture. Now what's the Bible say here? Because 69 weeks have already passed for Israel. There's one more week left for Israel. It's not for the church. Okay? Look at this. 70 weeks are determined for who? For your people and for your holy city. Daniel was a Jew, correct? For your, 70 weeks are determined for your people, which is a Jew, and for your holy city, which is Jerusalem. And continue. To finish the transactions, to make an end of sin, to make a reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness. Huh. And people say, oh, this already happened in 70 AD. Really, my friend. Wow. Where in the world is the everlasting righteousness? If you ask me, this world is getting more worse. Exactly what my Bible tells me. It's going to get more worse. And it says clear. To bring in everlasting righteousness. To seal up vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. That's going to happen at the second coming. 69 weeks have already passed. During the 69 weeks, the church was not present. During the 70th week, the church will not be present. Go to verse 27. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. Now the word week there in the Hebrew is Shabuah, which is a period of seven years. That is what that is referring to. So, by these mid tribbers and they're totally off doctrine as well, man. It's just incredible, ladies and gentlemen, the stuff that I found out. Oh, pre-wrath. God's not going to pour out his wrath until the last trumpet. Really. Where in the world did you get that idea from? You see, they know. They know that they're not appointed to wrath because these people have eyes that can read. These post tribbers cannot read it because the Bible is clear. And many of these post tribbers also believe, oh, the tribulation is not God's wrath. And some of them even admit, well, the Bible says we're not appointed to wrath. So you know what? God's pouring his wrath out at the very end. Yeah, right. How in the world? The tribulation cannot even start until the restrainer is taken out of the way, my friend. Which means the Antichrist cannot come on the scene until the restrainer, which is the, 
which is the influence of the church, because the Holy Spirit cannot be removed. He's omnipresent. He's everywhere at all times. Read it. Psalms 139, which means it's the church. It's the influence of the church that is taken out. And then, and only then, can the Antichrist be revealed, which means he cannot come onto the scene and sign that seven-year peace treaty, which begins and starts the seven-year period of tribulation. And yet these people are totally whacked. They're totally messing around with God's word. But look, Revelation chapter 6 talks about the Antichrist coming into power. And by the way, it's Jesus opening the seals. And the second seal was to take peace from the earth. And it goes on. It gets more worse and more worse. So Revelation chapter 6 clearly shows that judgment is falling way, way before the seventh trumpet. And that's not the last trumpet. Come on. That is not the last trumpet. There's different terms that saying stuff. Like saying, you're looking cool today. And I say, hey, you're going down to Canada? It's really cool there. There's different ways of saying stuff. Okay? It's totally different. The last trumpet is talking about, because right now, because the Jews rejected Jesus Christ. Okay? So God revealed mysteries to the Apostle Paul. That's why you cannot find the rapture in Matthew or any of that. He revealed it to Paul. It was a new revelation. That's why Jesus said when he was praying to his disciples before he got arrested, I have much more to tell you, but now you cannot bear it. But later you will. He revealed the mystery of the rapture. That's why he said, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. For the last trump will sound, and the dead will be raised, and we shall be changed. The last trump is what ends the church age. That's the very purpose of the rapture, because you can't have the Jews and the church running around at the same time, because it messes up God's program, because he, he has a certain program for the church, and he has another program for Israel, because Israel is going to be the head of the nations during the tribulation, which means you cannot have the church here, so it's clear. They're messing up God's program, they're trying to destroy the unity that God has planned for the nation of Israel, these mid-tribbers. And they're just messing up God's program that he has. And they're totally off. The wrath of God is falling way before the seventh trumpet, my friend. It's very clear. So it says clear right here, right? Look at this. Keep, continue reading. Go to, look at this part here. And the kings of the earth, the great man, the rich man, the commanders, the mighty man, every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. Jesus Christ is the Lamb. Remember John the Baptist? Behold the Lamb of God, who taketh away the sin of the world. So it says clear, the wrath of the Lamb. God is pouring his wrath out on the earth. And look what it says, For the great day of his wrath has come. And who is able to stand? Who is able? Hmm. It's an awful time. Very awful, my friend. So, okay, let me see here. And plus, we're to be looking for the blessed hope. Why in the world would you be looking for the blessed hope if you have to go through hell on earth? And plus, this too would make no sense. This is what Paul said. Listen to this. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all those who have loved his appearing. You wouldn't be loving his appearing if you had to go. You're going to die. You're not going to even survive a year, man. Massive a life. You wouldn't love his appearing. You'd rather die and go be with him that way. But Scripture clearly tells us we're to be looking for Christ. We're not commanded to be looking for the Antichrist or tribulation or any of that stuff. So, it's very clear. Now, the day of the Lord is the tribulation period. Now, let's go and see what God's going to do during the tribulation here. You guys can read the whole entire book of Revelation, and you guys can see there. It's an awful time. Seven seals, seven trumpets, seven vials. But look at here. Isaiah chapter 13, verse 9. Behold, the day of the Lord comes, cruel, with both wrath and furious anger, 
to lay the land desolate, and he will destroy its sinners from it. And if you continue going, if you continue reading, it says clear, the sun will be darkened, and it's going forth, and the moon will not cause its light to shine. I will punish the world for its evil, and the wicked for their iniquity. Huh. So, these post trippers are saying, ah, oh, that's going to happen at the very end? Ah, uh, then why in the world do you have Jesus gathering the nations? When my Bible clearly tells me here, I will punish the world for its evil, and the wicked for their iniquity. And if you continue reading, where it says, Therefore I will shake the heaven, and the earth will move out of her place. And that cannot even happen until the peace treaty is signed. We saw it clearly right here, the day of the Lord. Even if you go to the book of, of uh, Zephaniah, and in Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 7, Alice, for that day is great, for it is the time of Jacob's trouble. And who does God reserve his wrath for? Let's find out, okay? Like, there's just so many things, ladies and gentlemen. I don't know if this, you know, I want to make a long video here, but I want it to upload and be able to get up and running. So I'm just going to see what happens. Look at this. Look, go to the book of Name. And God says clearly who he reserves his uh, judgment for. Look what it says here. God is jealous and the Lord avenges. The Lord avenges and is furious. That means he's really mad now. The Lord will take vengeance on his, look at this, adversaries. And he reserves wrath for his enemies. It's very clear. He reserves wrath for his enemies. So we're going to the book of Zephaniah. Look at this. Chapter 1, verse 14. The great day of the Lord is near. It is near. And heavens quickly. The noise of the, of the day of the Lord is bitter. There the mighty man shall cry out. The day is a day of wrath. A day of trouble and distress. A day of devastation and delusion. A day of darkness and gloominess. A day of clouds and thick darkness. A day of trumpet and alarm. Against the four cities and against the rich, the high towers. I will bring distress upon man. And they shall walk like blind men. Because they have sinned against the Lord. Their blood shall be poured out like dust. And their flesh like refuge. Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath. But the whole land shall be devoured by the fire of his jealousy, for he will make speedily reduce of all those who dwell in the land. Huh. Sounds to me that's wrath, man. That's judgment falling. People need to learn how to read English. Maybe you post trippers need to go study English. Go to an English school or do study English. Because it looks like to me you guys can't read and you guys want to preach heresies and lies that you guys are going to regret it one day. And this too. Why in the world would God say this as well? Go to the book of Amos. Just go to the book of Amos for now. I'm going to read this to you guys right now. In the book of Amos. Chapter 5, verse 18. Now explain to me all these post trippers Oh, we can't wait for the tribulation. We can't wait. We're going to suffer for Christ. We need to purge. We need to go through the tribulation to purge ourselves. We need to purge and cleanse ourselves. Really. Whatever happened to the blood of Jesus Christ, there's only one way, and that is through the cross of Jesus Christ. The blood of Christ washes us from all our sin. The Bible is very clear. These people are distorting the gospel. And I found out that these, these teachings are the exact same teachings as Catholicism and Mormonism. Now, what does the Bible say in Amish chapter 5, verse 18? Let us read it and see what God has to say about that. Look what God says to you post-tribbers and mid-tribbers. This is the inerrant word of the living God, and this is what God has to say. Right here. Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. For what good is it? The day of the Lord to you. It will be darkness and not light. It will be as though a man fled from a lion and a bear met him, or as though he went into the house, leaned his hand on the wall, and a serpent bit him. Is not the day of the Lord darkness and not light? It is not very 
dark with no brightness in it. The Bible is very clear, my friend. God says, woe to those who desire the day of the Lord. See, even in God's faithfulness, this, he's not talking to the people of this time because obviously God is all-knowing. He's omniscient and he knows everything about everything. He knew that these people were going to be dead long before. He's talking to the Jews because he was telling them, why do you want to go through that time? Just accept Jesus Christ. Accept my son that I'm about to send to you. Because God rose up prophets after prophets saying, I'm sending you a Savior. I'm sending you a King to redeem you from your sin. They still said no. So God says, woe to those who desire. Saying that's how bad it is going to be. You don't even want to be in it. And you don't even have to be in it. Yet the Bible is very clear, my friend. Now, let us go to the teachings of Paul. But before I get into that, even here, look, look. Right here. Go to Romans, okay? Romans chapter 5, verse 9. What does it say? Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Romans chapter 8. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. No condemnation. Not some. Not a few. Not a little. None. You're set free. Jesus' death on the cross accomplished it all. It is finished. He finished it. He suffered once and for all for sin. This too here would make no sense. Let's read it. Romans chapter 11 verse 25. For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery. You see, it's a mystery, my friend. Mystery. Lest you should be wise in your own opinion that blindness in part has happened to Israel. Now, why in the world has blindness happened to Israel if we're all going to go through the tribulation together? Why isn't God saving them at the same time? It would not make any sense, my friend. It's because they rejected Jesus Christ as Messiah, so God has called himself a bride, he's called himself a church, and now he's working on the church when the last Gentile believers say, Zap, we're out of here to the glory of God. Look what it says clearly. Why is in your own opinion that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. That's talking about us. That last person comes into the church, zap, we're out of here. And so all Israel will be saved. Why isn't there any people being added more to the church? What about the church? It's all saying Israel will be saved. What about more people coming into the church? Uh, it doesn't have to mention the church because the church is not going to be here. Use your head. Use your head, people. I don't care what people think about me. I'm standing and I'm fighting for the truth. I'm going to defend this book until the day that I die. And I give no bones to what I say. I give no bones whatsoever. Now let's go to Colossians. Or Galatians. This is what Paul had to say. And let's see what Paul thought. Okay? Let us go and see what Paul had to say here. But, verse 8, But even if we, or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you look at that then what we have preached to you what did Paul preach to them we're gonna find out in a minute people what Paul preached to them okay now what we preach to you let him be accursed as we have said before so now I say again if anyone preaches any other gospel to you then what you have received let him be cursed these post trivers are cursed these mid trippers are cursed. I know I'm using powerful language. I can say that because of the Bible. Paul said, other than what you received. What did, Paul, what, did, what did Paul preach to them? Well, let's find out. Let's go to Thessalonians right now. Let's go to the book of Thessalonians right now. Okay? The day of the Lord, like we just saw. It's an awful time. It's the tribulation period. But yet, Paul's right here. But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourself know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of the light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us be watch, let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. 
But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith, love, and of the helmet of hope of salvation. That day will not overtake you because you're not going to be here, which it can overtake you because you're not going to be here. What does he say in verse 9? For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to attain salvation. Now that's not the wrath of hell. That's the wrath of the tribulation period because Paul is talking to them about the day of the Lord. They signed the peace treaty after the rapture. They think finally world utopia, world peace is here. And then suddenly, without warning, boom, the tribulation starts and they shall not escape. Very clear, my friend. And yet even in here, Second Thessalonians, they're all they're troubled because there's a false teaching going around telling them that the day of Christ had come. The day of Christ is not the same thing. It's the rapture. Our gathering together. You're being caught up. Don't let anyone deceive you because they wrote a false letter supposedly writing down Paul's name. So Paul had to come back. Didn't I tell you these things before? What has to happen? There has to be a falling away. And the man of sin has to be revealed. But don't you remember what I told you? The man of sin cannot be revealed until the restrainer is taken out. Look, verse 5 and on. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? And now you know what is restraining that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawlessness one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth. The one that's going to be revealed, that's the one Jesus is going to destroy. And we're not going to see him. So thank God. And by the way, he's the first seal that is unleashed. Like, there's just so many things, ladies and gentlemen, I can go into. Like, the judgment seat of Christ, you cannot find it in Matthew. It's the judgment of the nations. The judgment seat of Christ. Where is that? He's seated in, in heaven. And we have crowns of gold. Revelation 4. We have white garments and golden crowns on our head. And plus this too. Look at this. 1 Thessalonians chapter 9. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and 9 and 10. What does it say? For they themselves declare concerning us, what matter of entry we had to you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, who he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. We're delivered from the wrath to come. Like we saw. That's why Paul had to come back. Don't you remember what I told you? We're to be waiting for his Son from heaven, who delivers us from the wrath to come. <coughs> and it says we're not appointed unto wrath, the church is not appointed unto God's wrath. And yet, if you go to Revelation chapter 6, verse 17, what does it say? For the great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? So if we're not appointed unto wrath, we cannot be in the great day of his wrath. It's judgment. We're not going to be here. And the post triggers off. That's at the very end, God's wrath. Really, you're going to be saying peace and safety at the very end when Armageddon has happened? Come on. Seriously. get You need a pill, man. You need to go get medication for yourself. You guys don't know how to read. So it says clear. Paul taught that. We're not appointed to wrath. That was the message. He says, if anyone preaches another gospel that I would I preach to you, let them be accursed. So these post tribbers are they preaching the same thing as the Apostle Paul? No, they're not. So they're preaching another gospel, which means they're cursed. And like, there's just so many things, ladies and gentlemen, that would not make sense. Jesus said to his disciples after he rose from the dead, Wait in Jerusalem for the promise of the Father which you've heard from me. For John baptized you with water, but many days from now I shall baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you shall receive power, and you shall be my witnesses in Judea, Samaria, Jerusalem, and to the ends of the earth. That was instructed to the church to preach to the whole world. And yet in Revelation chapter 7, why in the world do you have 144,000 sealed Jews preaching to the world? Because the church is not here. It's a different dispensation. Even the murders under the altar, they're, they're crying out for revenge. Us in this time, we do not call out for revenge. We pray for those that persecute us. We pray for those. We bless those that curse us. And yet you see a different thing going on here in the book of Revelation. It mentions, how long, O Lord, until you avenge our blood upon those? And he goes on and on. So you have the Jews preaching the gospel. Because the church is here. And if you notice, it says clearly... That they were sealed. The Jews were sealed. Why, didn't the, why aren't the billions and billions of church members sealed? Because they're not here. We're in heaven with our Lord. That is the word of God, my friend. 
God is still going to have a light to share the gospel during the tribulation through the 144,000, through the two witnesses of Revelation chapter 11, and through the angels of Revelation chapter 14, verse 6. The Bible is very clear, my friend. Don't be fooled by these post-tribbers and mid-tribbers. Believe what the Word of God says. I just showed you clear from Scripture. If you guys have to go through this video, pause it, check up Scripture, go right ahead and do it. I would never lie to God's people. I tell people what the truth is, and this is the truth. I'm going to stand up for the Word of God. I'm not going to let anybody distort it. And these people have an appointment with God. You will face God on the day of judgment. God's Word will be proven true. When the rapture happens, you guys are in for the greatest shock of your life. And that's it. When it happens, that is it. No more arguments. You're going to see that what I said to you was the truth. Because this is the word of God. And my God is not a liar. He's not a man that he should lie. Every word of God will be brought to pass specifically, accurately, correctly, as he said. And in detail. Everything. And we're about, it's about over, folks. We're about to leave this planet. So for my brothers and sisters in Christ out there, live ready, stay ready, be ready. Our king is coming. When that last trumpet sounds, zap, we're out of here to the glory of God. I'm just waiting for the call. That's all I'm waiting for. This is all i got to say, and God bless you all.